the Compass, the Journal for ASCAP. Okay. He is a former board member of the National Council for Black Studies, and Dr. Carr has been named Professor of the Year several times by Howard University students. Right. He was also named 2013-2014 HBCU Male Faculty Member of the Year at the fourth annual HBCU Media Week Awards. Dr. Carr designed the curriculum framework for Philadelphia's mandatory high school, African American history course, and co-founded Philadelphia Freedom Schools. Right. A community-based academic initiative that has involved over 13,000 K-12 students. Wow. Dr. Carr's publications have appeared in Among Other Places, The African American Studies Reader, Socialism and Democracy, Africana Studies, Publications of the Modern Language of America, The National Urban League's 2012 State of Black America, and Malcolm X, a historical reader. So without further ado, I would like everyone to give a round of applause to Dr. Greg Kamaki Carr. So tonight, sometime late tonight, I'm going to go sit down and jot down the notes of none of these names and dates and folks who I may have been vaguely aware of and now I'm much more closely aware of, just from general conversations. And um, you all, I want to thank you all in particular for continuing to send your revolutionaries to Washington, D.C. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's right. The first time, I don't know, maybe the first time was in Detroit. and. Uh, and Zay and uh, Nachi here and, here and uh, a lot of ASCAP folk to talk to. Her. Indeed, thank you, Nana. That's right. And um, talked to Brother Kwesi earlier, Brother Abdul. And uh, this is around 1995, I guess we had our right. conference yeah. here yeah. Right. down in Kobo. Right. right. And uh, we came back a few months later to plan the first volume of the African World History Project. Right. And uh, a couple of teenagers, uh, they were teenagers at the time, uh, met one who's, who's coming out of high school and Malika's mom is here. I guess her child's now about the same age she was, a little bit younger than she was when we first met her 20 some years ago. And uh, Ajwa, man, and that child, she, I, can't, I got to Howard, she was there. So um, it's not just Cass and Renaissance, although I know those schools produce a steady stream of students including for two for Kathy and Cass to, to come to Howard. But over the last two decades, y'all have kept kept us kept us replenished. And at eight o'clock in the morning on Tuesdays and Thursday mornings, I knew if I didn't see for two, something was wrong. But she was always sitting in the front, at the corner, right like where she's sitting right now. So that always gave me energy. So I want to thank you dear. And uh, we'll be going to Kim shortly. So uh, When we, uh, I guess we were in Atlanta a couple of years later at Morehouse, this would have been 2000, which meant we came back here in 99, I think. This was the year after Dr. Clark passed uh, for the National ASCAP Conference, we were over at Wayne State. And, um, you know, at that time, uh, the Ziggy Way, uh, Ziggy Way's mom is in here somewhere. Yeah, uh, they yeah, over yeah. there. The next, uh, the next year, I guess, we were in Atlanta. We walked around to the uh, to the ancestors who are buried in the yard there at the Atlanta University Center. He and I, um, that was uh, Benjamin Mays, and Sadie Mays, and John Hope, buried there at Atlanta University. Some of our great educators. So, um, I want to thank you, Brother Kwasi, for 
making it so that I don't have to talk about the origins of African liberation day because you laid it out better than I appreciate it, among many other things. And I tried to posture as a revolutionary, but in some ways I believe that um, John Henry Clark, who probably saved me from a career, a beginning career as a lawyer, because I'd quit by now doing that. When he said all I ever want to be was a great classroom teacher, uh, that really had a resonating effect on me. So I try to do what I can contribute in the classroom with young people. Um, it's very important because you know, you all know about that here, of course. You all know about that here in Detroit. Because uh, again, uh, I just remember it came out of uh, Aisha Shule. Mm -hmm. Boys of Canada. So that ancestor is mine. Mine, mine. That's, that's not a game. So give her again another shout. That's just a shout. And thank you, Nana, for that libation. She set us right in the mood so, and in the, in the space. So, when Nzinga uh, gave me the charge, talk about breaking the chains, and I left the F S off there, but I'll take chains as a broader conceptual thing, awakening the African in us. I just want to talk a little bit about oh, this wow. Metanephra on Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. It's a good speech. Yeah. Um, we've got experts in language. Uh, we've got one who's a member of this community, Mario Beatty at Howard, and one of his uh, closest uh, comrades, confidants, and compatriots in the study of Egyptian language, one of the finest students and teachers of that language anywhere, of course, is Benachi Montgomery. So I'm going to give him a, a recognition. I'm going to be here in Detroit much, much longer than most. And we know that this brother here was uh, and remains now as an ancestor, one of our great comrades in the study of classical Africa, this uh, son of, of Texas, this African born in Texas. And I'm going to, uh, hope you're not going to kill me. Can I move around a little bit? Okay. Sure. All right, just, no, I want to make sure, because I know they, and I'm not going to disturb the ancestors here. Because that was, all right, that's perfect. All right, I'm just going to do this here, just a little bit. So Dr. Hugh Brothers, here he is when he received his, uh, Medu Yahu, his staff of old age. Uh, that was in a ceremony in Chicago off Lakeshore Drive, and that Jehudi, which uh, Mama Ife still has, of course, in Chicago, uh, was actually presented to him that day by John Henry Clark. So literally the passing, the transmission of the staff for old age. So I always loved that picture of him. You see how happy he is, you know. And uh, he says, you know, one of, the, one of the talks that he gave, he talks about the reason why elders are still here. And he says, one of the things that elders are here for, he said, you know, you, you hang around to teach. And so that, that, that's important to understand. That staff of old age is an investment. So this is one of his more famous lines. He says, you know, we can say at this point, the battle of liberated African thought from non-existence has been decisively won. We know that black folks did stuff. Not enough of us know, which is why we have to keep reminding ourselves and teaching. But, but we kind of kind of have that at least on the radar screen. The African defenders and European saviors have demolished the fabricators and their collaborating African scholars on that front. Sure. Now we must rescue the victim from European philosophy and science. Right. The yeah. systems, Brother Kwasi began to talk about the political economy, the structure itself. That's right. Right? Because everybody loved being black. I mean, you know, the President of the United States was at Howard a couple of weeks ago at Woo. University Commencement. And, you know, he's a uh, He's received the beautiful love and support of uh, Africans from all over the country and all over the world. Support he did not earn, but support that we have somehow given him on the strength of what we hoped he would do. Right. Funny thing about black people, right? we got a lot of hopes, right? God of our weary years, God of our silent tears. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> we, you know, you know. Mm -mm -mm. born in the days when, boy, felt, in the, felt in the day when hope, un hope unborn had died. died. Right. So when somebody come talking about hope and he got a Luyo last name, then you know, hey, we are on board. Although the NASA's community here in Detroit was probably less fool than most people because y'all you know, right. got real experience with Negro politicians turning left. But at any rate, when he came and spoke at Howard, he talked about 
where, whether or not this was the best time for black people to be alive. And he said, it is the best time that there's ever been in African America. And if you could choose any time in American history to be alive, it would be right now. He's talking to black folks there in the yard Howard. And you know, I thought about that in the context of what he was saying, because then he named as the examples Kendrick Lamar, Beyonce, and uh, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan owns the Hornets, Beyonce runs the world, and Kendrick Lamar is, you know, and the students cheered, and, you know, and some of us sat there and looked like, wow. And I thought about it because in two, in two contexts. One, Martin King. Dr. King, who, of course, uh, tried out his uh, concepts that he introduced on the mall in 1963 in August here in Detroit in an album that Barry Gordy released where he talks about in a little bit more strident tone here in Detroit and what it is about Coco Hall makes Negroes get black 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 when he got on the, got on the mall he named him until in that Detroit speech if that, but at any rate but but I thought about Dr. King because when he during the Montgomery bus boycott you know he, he stood up and he gave a talk and he said you know if you could pick any time and period, if I could pick any time and period to be alive, I would pick this time. But he said, I would pick this time because when the history books are written, well. it will show that this was a moment when uh, a, 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 a race of black people stood up and injected new meaning into the veins of civilization. Yeah. I said, that's a little bit different than saying this is the greatest time to be alive because we got great entertainers. We ain't never had no problem with people being uh, entertained by black people, which is why we look back here at Corellas and he says, you know, African deep thought must now speak for itself. Yeah. We have to rescue the victim from European philosophy and science because, you know, we never need rescuing from being entertained. No. Y'all ain't, you know, y'all gave the whole world entertainment right now. Somewhere in a mall, somebody is playing, whenever I'm with you, something inside. You know, I'm listening, you know, and, but I, I love that song because I think about it. We need this governor y'all got, right? That's what she said. Could it be the devil in me, or is this the way love's supposed to be? It's like a heat wave. I'm saying, this, could it be the devil in me? Or is this the way love's supposed to be? Breaking the chain. Being an African in us. Could it be the devil in me? In other words, when you internalize, Logic that doesn't make any sense. European philosophy and science. Right. You might think that your open enemy is working on your behalf. And I think there are some black people in Michigan who actually think the governor of Michigan is just making mistakes. Oh. No, this dude is our open enemy. Now, can that be the devil in me? Or is this the way love supposed to be? What do you love? You love democracy? Because they don't. Well, you love equality for everybody? Because they don't. Uh, Maybe that's the devil in you. So anyway, don't go to Detroit game, the world Motown. And, it, and sometimes I listen to those Motown lyrics and I say, y'all snuck a whole lot of stuff past people that know pop tunes, right? Anyway, let's not even get into that. That's a whole other conversation. This is the Charles Wright Museum. So I know y'all have those conversations over and over again all the time. And in my mind, my eyes on the clock. So I don't want to wind that up. But I want to talk about this question of freeing the African and breaking the chain. I want to start with Dr. Corrales because he says African deep thought must now speak for itself rather than set up an interview schedule containing the great issues of European philosophical inquiry. Trying to connect the way we think to the way other people think, good, bad, or indifferent. And I know that that's certainly not something that Detroit needs to have any more lessons on in terms of people in this room. Because the whole arguments and conversations between the cultural nationalists and revolutionary nationalists and the Marxists and the, the Pan-Africans, that's the Detroit conversation. Some of the best thinking we've ever produced has come out of this city. And many of the people in this room have participated in those conversations. So, you know, but some of that, some of that uh, thinking came out of real arguments with people who had set up an interview schedule with the great issues of European philosophical inquiry. Is it class or race? That's right. Could it be both? Yeah, it could be both, but we need to adopt a scientific socialist approach. I mean, this African Liberation Day is very important, right? Because after Nkrumah sets this up as a day of solidarity, international solidarity with, with Africa. By 1972, when the African Liberation Support Committee, and some of y'all were in that organizational formation, called for African Liberation Day to be celebrated around the country and called for a big march in Washington, D.C. You see over 50,000 people show up, and they march past, some of y'all may have been there, Park marched past the South African Embassy, end up by the Washington Monument, and they have these real conversations. 
But many of those conversations would soon fracture. We'll talk about that in a minute, particularly with a scholar named Ron Walters. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in a second. So Dr. Carruthers says, you know, African champions must, and here it is, break the chain that links African ideas to European ideas and listen to the voice of the ancestors without European yeah. interpreters. That's why they study, that's why, that's why we study the language, right? African champions must break the chain that links African ideas to European ideas and listen to the voice of the ancestors without European interpreters. Yeah. Now that sounds good, but what does that mean? Well, that's where it gets difficult. Kwame and Krum and the Origins of African Liberation Day, we've already heard, right? There he is with Kwame Ture, and we know who that is on the right. Shirley Graham Du Bois. Shirley Graham Du Bois, absolutely right. With her revolutionary looking like she could be in Mao's China, right? <laughs> Chinese seem to have forgotten them days <laughs> as they go into Africa now and decide what parts of it they want to colonize. Exactly. Bringing millions of Chinese workers throughout the continent of Africa <laughs> to build the roads and bridges and mine and stuff. And the Africans now are faced with another invasion. And the Africans in the diaspora, what's our role? I don't know, I'm not quite sure. Where's the, where's the President of the United States today while we're here? What's your favorite? Exactly, because the Pacific Rim now is a little nervous. What is China up to? But Japan is in Korea. You know, they don't necessarily have pan-Asianism. The world is now trying to choose up sides on the next role. And China and Japan are now fighting over how they're going to export their markets into not only the African world and the West, but also in their Asian neighbors, yeah. right? So the President of the United States is not over there advancing the interests of African people. In fact, the one African that we know he talked about in the last two days, anybody know who that is? That's the brother who uh, raped the Japanese girl. And when Prime Minister A, yeah, I'm sorry, he, you know, God, please don't let him be black. Yeah, he was black. And yeah, and when Abe met, the Prime Minister of Japan met with the President uh, yesterday, Obama was supposed to be going there trying to talk about relations between the United States and Japan and economics. Abe, they say, for most of the meeting, all Abe wanted to talk about is, you're going to extradite this guy? We want to try him in our courts. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's a nationalist move. I can respect that. But at the same time, I wonder if it was a white dude, would you have said that same right. thing and spent them? I just don't know. Because you know, this race thing is real. Right. And we know the contempt typically that the Japanese have had for black people unless we can serve their purposes. So Shirley Graham Du Bois dressed the way that, that now may have dressed. There they are. And of course we know that Kwame Ture, the Dalai African People's Revolutionary Party, is one of the main people who helped spread African Liberation Day here. So it's, we, we always give him the volume for that. And it goes all the way back in Detroit. Now of course this brother right here Malcolm X talking about the global African. We're right up on another anniversary, right? Brother Mike and Hotel uh, had me on his show several times this past week. We've been talking about Malcolm. We just passed his birthday again. I see here at the right, you had a celebration. Of course you would. I mean, in some ways, this is Malcolm X's home, right? So, I mean, this is uh, not just the state of Michigan, but Detroit. May 19th, in fact, it was here in Detroit, 1995. It was the first and last time we got a chance to see Brother Wilford, his brother. Paul Lee brought him by Cobo Hall to meet us. I was like, man, I can't believe I'm shaking this dude's hand. He smiled and said, that's Malcolm dead in the face. This is amazing to see the living link. But at any rate, you know, Brother Malcolm, of course, giving the Battle of the Bullet speech, message to the grassroots, was a Detroit conversation. It's very important. I mean, it's, it's amazing to think about what this community has contributed to the African world, and not just to the African world, but to the globe in terms of shifting the way we think, in terms of breaking chains. And we can, we're to an internal debt, internal debt to Detroit. And then Malcolm talking about this question in the Battle of the Bullet made me think about Obama. That's the second thing I was saying, Dr. King, but also Malcolm, who gave that talk and then set off for his Hajj, 1964. 
you know, everybody's all hyped. They're watching HBO now because they've done this uh, movie based on the play uh, all the way on Lyndon Johnson and the passage of the Voting Rights Act, sorry, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And people talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in the United States of America and saying that's the end of the Civil Rights era. And then you have the Watts explosion in, the, in late 1965 and the Black Power era. And of course, that's when Detroit, which has always been active, steps on center stage in the Black Power era. That's the period we heard Brother Kwasi talking about a little bit there. I can't listen to Aretha Franklin and not think about CL and think about the police fighting with them in New Bethel and, and the rough public of New Bethel. I mean, all that, all that really gestates in that late 60s period. But Malcolm gives this talk and he asks, is it the battle or the bullet? Mm -hmm. Then I'm gonna get on this well, plane and go make this hajj. And by the time he comes back, Freedom Summer is well underway. And of course, we see the Civil Rights Act of 1964 pass in part because two white young men who went to Mississippi, well, tell it. Michael Schwerner, say it again? Goodman. That's right, Goodman, that's exactly right. Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner lost their lives. And James Cheney also lost his life and was castrated. But it's interesting because and in, in yeah. many of you all know, many of the members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee were in that formation. And I uh, got a chance to talk to Brother Jones, who actually wrote the song in the Mississippi River on the 50th anniversary of SNCC 2010. They were in North Carolina in Shaw. I took some Howard students down. We are sitting there, man. I said, I always wanted to meet you, brother. Tell me, who y'all thinking about? Some of the great songs. My favorite SNCC song is Odinga Odinga, the one the SNCC singer sang. That's the one where, actually, that was in New York. They performed that when Malcolm X spoke, but before him, Fannie Lou Hamer spoke. <laughs> Same thing, <laughs> you know, and Malcolm said, that's my favorite song, Ogingo Odinga. They're talking about how the Kenyans came to Atlanta and the white folks in Atlanta tried to convince the Kenyan delegation after they had gotten their independence that, oh, America isn't that bad, and the SNCC students was like, oh, it's terrible, where's the guy? We want to talk to him. So they made up this song where they imagined that the Kenyans said, you know, if you don't, why you white folks don't straighten up, we're going to call Jomo Kenyatta. And the refrain, of course, is, oh, gingo, dingo, oh, gingo, dingo, oh, gingo, dingo, of Kenya, who, oh, gingo, dingo, and then they go, ooh, 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 Freedom now. So you see them put the key spot handy with the freedom now. That SNCC is beginning to think in a Pan-African mode. And of course, Malcolm was able to talk to them in Alabama shortly before he was killed. But in 1964, he comes back to America when SNCC is under assault. And when Matthew Jones and his comrades wrote in the Mississippi River, and I heard Bernice Johnson Reagan of Sweet Honey and the Rock, who was one of the SNCC singers, Harambe singers before Sweet Honey and the Rock, tell this story. She said, you know, and Jones and them confirmed it. We wrote that song because while they were looking for those three workers because two white kids had been killed, they found so many other bodies. Yeah, right. That's right. Matthew Jones. Have y'all ever heard that song? It starts with, oh my God, it could, it could be, it could be a, a con funeral dirge. Yeah, the Mississippi River. Then you hear the sister. Lord, 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 Lord. In the Mississippi River, well, you can count them one by one. It could be your son, count them two by two. It could be me or you or me, count them three by three. Do you want to see, count them four by four? And then the refrain goes, well, I uh, hit to the river they go and they go all the way up to ten count them five by five with their hands tied count them six by six holes throughout their body in Mississippi they got it fixed like Schwerner like Goodman like Cheney then they start naming the rivers the Yazoo River the Tallahatchie River in the Mississippi River but the point I'm making is y'all would never have found those bodies if you had the two white kids having been killed right. Right. Not that they didn't make the ultimate sacrifice, but let's be clear. Yes. Which is why Dave Dennis stood up at the funeral of James Cheney and said, we're going to rule over them like they ruled over us. I'm tired of going to funerals. Yes. Yeah. He looked at Cheney's son and said, I see Ben Cheney sitting there, so I'm tired of going to funerals. Dave Dennis, man. These are young people. So when Malcolm comes back, he comes back to the civil rights 
Act of 1964 being debated. And in that debate, most historians argue that it was the blood of those three civil rights workers that actually allowed Lyndon Johnson to break the back of a recalcitrant Senate and push the Civil Rights Act of 1964 through. 1965 was a different story. But we know what happened in 1965. Malcolm lost his life. And the Voting Rights Act, which Johnson severed from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, was passed. But I bring this up because Malcolm by 1964, out of the Nation of Islam, and Michael Hotep talks about this, he may bring it up tomorrow. Malcolm X begins to expand his idea of the global African. He doesn't just go to North Africa and the so-called Middle East. That's right. And that wasn't his first trip. But Malcolm connects with the Africans, the African students in West Africa. They give him the name Owale, right? Son who's returned home. The one who's returned home. You see him talking to Africans who are uh, meeting in other places like London. And when he comes back to the United States, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, he's talking about this pan-African thrust. A thrust, of course, that Nkrumah endorses. But of course, Detroit being the cradle, of Africana next to them. I just like that picture of these young black girls reading, right? It's very important, and we can talk more about that. In fact, I'm not going to talk uh, long tonight. I'm talking 23 minutes, and that's long enough. I really want to, I want us to have more of a conversation tonight at the Charles Wright Museum because it's an important place. You know, there are a lot of those, uh, no, no, there's not a lot of these circular places in our museums, but for some reason we keep putting circles in our museums. The Native American Museum in Smithsonian has a very nice one, and they take their culture very seriously at the Native Museum of the American Indian. Yeah. Uh, it's very interesting because, you know, I went by King's, Abdul, the first one took me over to John King 20 years ago, and that's why I stay broke every time I come to Detroit. So, <laughs> my two indulged me, and you know, she got, the, she got them together, and Brother Kinley took me over there, so we was able, I was able to get a couple of pieces. I already had this piece, John, uh, Dr. Wright's book on ropes, and some of y'all knew Dr. Wright, so, this is a, you know, he loved ropes, and this was his man, right? Love, love ropes. I did not have this one he did, though. And he edited Paul Ropes in 1896 to 1976. This is a different one I didn't have. And they both signed by him. So, you know, but that's what happens when we are not diligent. They're safe now. Because ultimately, when I make my transition over before, all of the books I have will be part of a communal archive. We have to have it. We had a great one here. But as that part, I'm saying that the reason they find their ways to great bookstores like John King's a great bookstore is because some people around this country, uh, country King's, Book of King's here in Detroit, Strand Bookstore in New York, Powell's Bookstore in Chicago, and Powell's in Portland, Oregon, all places I read as much as I can, which is why I ain't got no money in the bank. But they read the obituary columns, they scan the newspapers, and they see estate sales, and they see who passed, and they send a team in with a check, because they have much more for the whole thing. Then they take your whole library somewhere, decide what they want, decide what they don't want. And what we have to do now as institutions, build, part of breaking the chain, part of freeing the African within us, means establishing places that we can have that are completely under our control. That's why we can talk like this in this space. We have to protect those kind of spaces, and part of it is for building our archive. So, in that process then, this is the New York African Burial Ground. I didn't show the Cosmogram, which is inside that building in the back. Many of y'all have been there. These are some Howard students from a couple of years ago. Every year we take every freshman in the College of Arts and Sciences and other students hear about it in the other schools, so we tell them y'all get on the bus too. And we take them, a uh, couple of years, we take them every Saturday in the month of September. We take them to the New York African Burial Ground because the 400 plus Africans who are reinterred in their burials here uh, they took their bones, they took their remains to Howard. And for 10 years, Howard scientists led the teams that, that studied them. And so we feel a spiritual obligation to go check on our ancestors. And a lot of these young people, 18, 19 years old, they didn't know nothing about that. That's why online education is a nice idea, but you really need to be in person. Well. Because you gotta put your hands on the young people and say, come on, let's take a trip, right? Now, you know, 20 years from now, some of them still gonna have their fists up. That's important. That is. Maybe only one of them, and we might only take but one. Because we don't know who out of Wells is gonna be. We don't know who Kwame Ture is gonna be in that picture. 
We just don't know. So it's important to do that work. So I want to talk very quickly about Ron Walters five types of Pan-African relationships. You know, this is this may be one of, if not some many of you all like, you know, got degrees from Wayne State or wage war over there or wage war and got degrees or took classes and did all kind of other stuff, liberated the space for five minutes to do. One of the most important things Wayne State ever did was its press published a book by Ron Walters called Pan-Africanism and the African Diaspora. It's one of the most important books written. Ron Walters, great ancestor now. Brother Walters spent a number of years struggling in Pan-African movements and formations and was in and out of the city many times. He talks about five types of pan relationships. He talks about